Professor Muni, uh, thank you very much. And at the outset, uh, please allow me to also join others in thanking Pramod Jaiswal and Nice. Uh, this Pramod is truly a wonderful effort. And I think what you have done would be a great template for others to follow if they could follow it. So kudos to you. Professor Muni, I like one thing very much, that you, a former ambassador of India, Arvind Gupta, Raghavan and myself are plugged in one element of this presentation and then the thinking guys will come after us so no, no, I this, thought is you know, how, this is how they listed you i i haven't done anything no. i haven't done anything this is how no, they have listed and wanted me to follow the list no no i'm not saying anything about you i'm talking about your former pupil promote jaiswal and promote i like this you know we must have a little bit of all of this reparty too now i want to thank raghava who's my great friend batchmate and so on for having introduced into the discourse an element of philosophy, an element of thinking, maybe political uh, international relations discourse also. These ideas of national interest, ideas of national security, ideas of national prestige. And if I focus on uh, the two countries to the north, uh, Nepal and slightly to Bhutan, they, these fit completely into that scenario. But Professor Muni, if you will allow me, I want to say something slightly contrarian here. First, I think all of us forget that South Asia, in sheer numbers and also in GDP, is going to be a very, very important part of the world. Within the next five years, India will possibly become the largest country in the world. We are currently the sixth largest economy, and I think we've taken a very big hit because of COVID. And so many of our aspirations may not get realized. But no matter these, we will certainly become the third largest economy in the world, whichever way we look at it, even in terms of the fact that COVID has hit us hard in terms of our economy. Now I want to say something which people in India usually are not very cognizant of, although of late, this has become quite fashionable which is the rise of two other countries in South Asia. One is, of course, Bangladesh, where everybody nowadays is talking about their economy, what they've done, and so on. And I think this is a tribute to their leadership, which has managed relationships externally very, very well. Remember, Bangladesh doesn't have the ability to do rent-seeking. It has no mineral endowment. It has almost very little except its human power. And they have harnessed that very well. We also forget the time when they had that fire, which almost wiped out the entire garment industry and how they bounced back. I would give a lot of credit to their leadership for having managed three relations extraordinarily well. India, China, and the West. I think we all in India tend to underestimate this. Secondly, even about Pakistan, for all the doldrums of their economy, let us understand that at 225 million people, it is already one of the largest societies in the world. And in the next 10 odd years, both Pakistan and Bangladesh will sit among the largest societies in the world, largest countries in population terms, and as one of the largest in GDP terms. And we in India should understand that our neighborhood first policy, therefore, has a huge set of elements of all of them. Let me also say something about Nepal. At 30 million, people in Nepal are very fond of saying small country. If Nepal was lo located in Europe, it would be the fifth largest country in that continent. Nobody would say it's a small country. But yes, as compared to India, China, as compared even to Bangladesh, Pakistan, it is a small country. Although in geography, etc., it's pretty big. But I want to say something to you about India, Nepal in economic terms. You know, if you leave India's exports to the United States and the United Arab Emirates and China, including Hong Kong out, which are all in the region of 35 to 25 billion dollars a year, the next 10 set of countries are in the region of 7 to 8 billion dollars. Now, a lot of reportage in India of late has been that Bangladesh has become our largest export destination. It's about 8 billion. Nepal, which remains four or five places below that, is at 7 billion. And Professor Muni, someone like you and many others who are listening to this, we have an open border. Believe me, 
India's legitimate trade. I'm not talking about, you know, smuggling, etc. Because there's an open border, things are allowed to be carried. The sale of Indian products in Nepal certainly exceeds Bangladesh. And in my opinion, Nepal would always rank among five largest export destinations of India. That, I think, is something if we internalize in India, it would make many, many things better. The next point I want to make is a very big point, which again in India, we tend to undersee, especially in the context of a country like Nepal, where we look at HDI figures, which are poor, poverty figures, which are poor, etc. But we forget and do not understand that since 1990, when Nepal started issuing passports, Nepal today is a very changed country. It's not just that it isn't a Hindu kingdom. There's no king and it has declared itself a secular country. I don't want to get into the current politics of Nepal. It isn't just that. It is the fact that it has come to face with globalization. More than 25% of Nepal's population is overseas and India is not the only place where they are going. They are there today in the Americas in large number, in Europe in huge numbers, in Southeast Asia in very large numbers, and of course in the Gulf. Indeed, if I recall, Qatar has a quota system and at some stage had decided that Nepalese and Indians would be roughly around the same number. And I think that continues to hold true. In fact, uh, I mean, on a lighter note, I might say that many people from both countries managed to obtain passports of the others to get over this quota business. But, you know, those are facts and realities of life. I think we in India need to understand that a country like Nepal and now I will say a country like Bhutan. Bhutan, as a result of the huge amount of wealth, India may be responsible because of buying hydropower. But the huge changes which are under, uh, undergoing these societies are going to be issues of challenge to India. And why do I say that? I say that because the aspirational requirements of societies, even in a poorer country like Nepal, are such that only India cannot meet. Just as we are unable to meet our own middle class's aspirations. Trade with China is not huge only because we import a large number of intermediary goods. It's also because every single thing that you and I perhaps consume and have elevated our lifestyle is because China has been there to be able to supply them. Earlier it was Japan and then South Korea, but now it's China. And that is the same change that you see in Nepal. You see, and you might even start seeing it in Bhutan, although it's a smaller country and far richer. In fact, many people don't understand that Bhutan perhaps is the country where the government finances students from its country to go abroad for higher studies, perhaps in the largest measure possible anywhere in the world. And it's not just to India. It's across the world today. And they have the abilities to be able to. So this change, globalization, uh, Professor Muni, I notice I have a few minutes, so I'll stop very shortly. Globalization is something we should understand. We also need to understand as part of globalization, the entire question of urbanization, which is going on. I want to stop here. I'll just leave one thought. In the midst of all this, for all the facts that India should realize, the changing scenario all around, these countries should also realize that at the end of the day, no matter what happens, India will become the third largest economy in the world. India will grow and go places. And so, therefore, they all have an automatic plus in being able to deal with India, its society, its economy. And if they start getting the politics of that right, the benefits will accrue to them perhaps more than they would accrue to us. We, in fact, have to become more used to the idea that an FTA with one of these countries may not necessarily result in that balance or that favorable balance that we are looking for. But the FTA, the larger FTA that I'm talking about, the FTA of connectivity, which uh, Mr. Arvind Gupta, Ambassador Gupta mentioned, these particular things would be certainly of their advantage, not just of our advantage. And it would make South Asia itself far bigger player and a greater, uh, let me say, stakeholder in the world. I want to uh, say something about climate change, etc. This is a global problem. We can all contribute locally, but the issues are global. So if something doesn't happen in the Americas, it's going to affect you. Uh, it is an issue of that kind. And I think on that, 
several of the countries do tend to have slightly different perspectives. Uh, Pakistan and India, for example, invariably share the same set of perspectives. Bangladesh, for a variety of its maritime reasons, has to have a different thing. And so does Nepal. But the fact of cooperation would do us all a lot of good. And I think everybody can benefit from India's growth and India from their doing well. Thank you very much, Professor Mohan.